handling, good funding about follow up to get a book signed. So, yeah. Not the guy who wrote the story. My name is B Sharp. I have the well, I my one claim to connection to the story is that I am one of the many people who have started an audiobook of Murphy Number Seven and have not gotten very far. But uh, well, good to see you all. My name is Fuzzy. Uh, I wrote Murphy Number Seven. <laughs> That was actually quite a moment there. That, that, that's, a, that's a memorable one for me. I felt that shiver go through me in every clap of that there. So thank you very much for that warm welcome. And not just to the con for this, but to America in general. Because I've never actually been to this country before. And it's been a hell of a time the whole time. And everyone I've met has been fantastic. So not just to you and your con, but to everyone, please thank you for welcoming me in so wonderful. Uh, it's been quite the experience so far. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I spent like yesterday getting buckshot, you know, bruises on my body. So I think I've done the Texan thing pretty well over here, you know. <laughs> All right. So as I, I have my friend here, Sharp, uh, B Sharp, he is going to just be helping facilitate things and to help me save my voice a little bit because I'm running another one later on today. Uh, he will be helping guide through, prompt and we'll also be taking in your QAs as well for later on. This is sort of a mixture of being prompted and talking, a bit of QA, and I have my own thing to present. Because the last thing I wanted to do was just come in here and say, hey, I'm some big shot Scotsman that maybe less than point not, not, not percent of the internet has actually heard of. So instead what I wanted to do is be able to offer something back that for those who are wanting to write their own stories and feel they want to go for a big thing, what actually goes into writing something at this scale. So I have some real detail about that that I can share with you. Some behind the scenes involving Murphy's creation, some sneak peeks at my notepads from doing it all, and we'll no doubt have uh, plenty of time for Q&A at the end, and even afterwards. Uh, I will be more than happy to hang around until the kick is out, and until even after I'm out there. More than happy for that. I will also preface and repeat, I am Scottish, I have an accent, if anyone at any time is uncertain or is struggling to keep up with it, please just let me know, because we do have a habit of just rambling on really quickly and using some slang that generally would either get you misunderstood slash arrested in some countries. Yeah. So please just let me know if anyone has a hard time with anything I've said. Do feel absolutely free to go, what did you mean by that, you dumb jock, at some point. <laughs> All right? I will hand over to Shar to uh, enter through then, and uh, we will start getting into the world of not only working number seven, but follow equestrian in general for those here who maybe not have read the story. In fact, before that, I, this is purely indulgent. If you've read working number seven, can you throw up your hand, please? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, I did not expect that. Genuine. All right, okay. I will happily hand over to you. Again, thank you all for the welcome and let's have a good time. <laughs> well, I guess we can start from the beginning. Uh, what the heck is Murphy number seven? If you don't mind, I'm going to take my jacket off while you answer. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, ignore, ignore my British UK references aside. Uh, so, yeah, so Murphy Number 7 is one of the recursive fan fictions that came up through Fallout Equestria. I'm sure if anyone's in here, you've probably at least heard of Fallout Equestria itself. And you will know that one of the things a lot of people do, and still do, is write their own stories set in that world. I. I genuinely felt the urge to do it myself and went through and then decided to go with something that was a bit different because most of them were some variant of your character comes out of the stable and they're going off into the world and it's very kind of almost video game construction design of quests and things as they go. I wanted to take an idea I'd had of someone just trying to escape one location. And I'd had that for years. I'd actually written previous stories in a very similar vein to it. I never really saw the light of day. And they carry forward into this, this running theme of escape. It felt inherently very easy to understand for someone getting into a story initially. So I decided to bring it into this. 
and with it, a uh, smaller scale scope, which, when you consider the novel that, novel, that you will see, uh, if someone like Pike, if you could hold it up, that would be a wonderful demonstration. Yeah, small scale, everybody. But what I really mean by that is small scale in terms of the scope within the story. It's all predominantly set in one city, and it's about someone trying to achieve a single goal to get out to have more personal stakes and to focus much more on a smaller geographic area and really go into depth with it, which I felt would make it stand out compared to a lot of the other globe-trotting stories, going to all sorts of areas across the map and encountering all sorts of stuff where characters would linger around and be in the same place and you'd know where they are at any point in the story. And somehow this took off. And I still can't explain it. <laughs> it did. Uh, it, it just took off and it really started taking on a whole life of its own for, uh, for this and uh, it really has surprised me to think back to the first day of writing notes in a hotel room in Leicester Square in London, starting writing notes for Murky Number 7 before he was even called Murky Number 7, which was also seven hours before I was due to have a meeting with the Facebook. <laughs> I was working advertisement, nothing big, but that was a very strange feeling to be writing that and then going in and accidentally saying pit fuck to a developer of Fallout oh. in Vegas. <laughs> he asked me what I said and I did not correct myself. I just, no, no, I'm, I'm gonna, no, I said pit boy, what, what are you talking about? No, you're crazy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's kind of how it came. That, that is kind of like where it came to be. For I, I wanted to throw my hat in the ring because I felt I had a unique story and perspective to tell, ultimately on it. All right. So it's worth noting, you know, going forward. As I said, it took off, and this really surprised me uh, in such a way that the first thing I actually want to do is thank everyone. For it because people who read it, people who have done anything with it, they were the ones who kind of made it happen. Not just the people who did art, although that is a big one, as I will mention in a second, but just people who read it and commented, both critique and praise, that content is what allowed me to actually go forward with something that large. And I will bring that up later as to the writing discipline of doing a big story, but mm -hmm. Art is such a big thing in Murky Number 7. Anyone who's read it knows how important artwork is to the theme of the story, to the creation of it. I am not really personally an artist, but I tried to write it from the perspective of an artist that somehow ended up getting a lot of artists to want to do art for it because it spoke to them in some way. Uh, and they helped it take off because artwork at that time was how a story really got noticed. So the more people were doing artwork for it, the more it got picked up. So I have such a thank you to the artists out there who saw something in this story and really elevated it and went with it and, and essentially put it out there for me. Uh, particularly Mr. Mech, who was the first guy who really was a big name artist doing a whole lot of stuff with it. It absolutely could not have happened without them. And since then, the stuff it's created has just been phenomenal. Uh, it, seeing these appear generally had a bit of a stunned reaction in my room. Sometimes some vocal noises, sometimes rather high-pitched vocal noises. And these are all scenes from the story at some point. And seeing that come to life, matching the lines become curves, curves become shapes, shapes become life from the story, is what really it made me realize and feel that I had to put my all into this from that point onwards, that something was actually working here for it. Uh, so I include that there not to simply say, look at all the cool art that was done on my story. I include that there as a demonstration of what I was looking at day to day and taking my inspiration from to go on with the story itself. That stuff is what drove me through it. It's not me that got something from that. Sorry, it's not it. I suppose to say, it's not uh, me that got something from that about it being there, it's me that got something from that about inspiring me forward, because that is murky, that is art, that is what drove him with it. Both the stuff that, both the stuff that I sometimes expected to see appearing there, 
And some of the artwork I necessarily didn't expect would appear here and there. <laughs> some of it kind of came out of nowhere. Some of it repeatedly. Some of it I can't show at the panel. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, oh. I mean, if your discretion advised, but I don't think we can go that far. So I, I will happily leave you to look at those ones for a moment to hand you back to Shark to uh, carry forward where this structure is going. Because I am honestly terrible for rambling, as people who have read a 1.1 million word story might realize. So I will happily allow Shark to steer me back on track. Well, it's funny you mentioned the length, because that was actually one of the things I was going to ask about next. How did you write this thing? That is a question I can honestly ask myself quite a lot. Like, how I know you do. You do ask it. Yeah. I've heard you ask it. Yeah. How I write it? Uh, well, as I said, this was partly planned, what I knew I'd be hearing. So I do have some stuff that I can share with you guys about what actually went into writing it. So, how to write a 1.1 million word story in 10 minutes or less or your money back. <laughs> I expect, that, you know, by the end of this con, I will see at least three of them. <laughs> so, by and large, there are, uh, people have talked in the past about that there are different types of writers, you know, between architects, between gardeners, or as I just learned last night, the road trip. Wonderful Captain Horse reference there, wherever you actually are. There he is, there he is. Uh, in this case, for writing something this long, I am very much an architect for it, and by that I mean that I like to plan everything before I start. At least to a degree that I understand where I'm going, and the changes that happen along the way, there's the road trip comparison, uh, were what I had to shift into midway. But at least to start with, I really needed to know where I was going. I had to have it put together. So, when I say I planned the length, I was incredibly wrong. I thought it would be the length of the original follow-up question, which is about 700,000. That didn't work. I did, however, know the rough chapter count. So, I didn't know I was going to have about 30 chapters. I think in the end it was about 32, plus a short. And that helped give me structure. Because even if the word count bloated, I knew how many chapters I had to fit in. I knew by this chapter I had to have this content done. And having that written out long before I even began was a huge boon to going forward and being confident in what I could plan and write. Because I knew where those big scenes had to be built up to. Uh, as part of this, I did what's often called a treatment. Uh, it's something often used in more creative industries. You don't hear it too much from a fandom side, but a treatment is essentially where you can get a summary or bullet-pointed look at what the structure of the story is going to be. The best comparison I actually have of that is you can essentially read a Wikipedia plot summary of a story, and that is not a million miles away from what you can really do with a treatment. So there's some other terms for it, and I've seen some people disagree in the exact form of it, but that is what uh, I was taught in university for it. So having summaries of the chapters before I write them helped that scale become more manageable. I knew what scenes were going into those chapters. I knew when this chapter arrived, this had to be happening by it. So I very much had the framework built before I went in. I, I had the contents of each chapter summarized and written up to chapter 18 before I even started writing chapter one, to give it a good example for that. Uh, there was about a half year of planning before I even began writing it. Within that, three act structures were going to be very helpful, not just overall. Many people know the basic beginning, middle, end of writing stories. What's often forgotten is you can make that recursive. You can go down again with it. You can go to the chapters, and each chapter can have its own beginning, middle, end. Each section of a chapter can have its beginning, middle, end. Each scene can have its beginning, middle, end. Each interaction can have its beginning, middle, end. Even paragraph, you can, if you're actually insane and you want to start planning that far. Not even I'm that crazy. But that helps, again, give structure. And the more structure you can build around what you're doing, the easier it's going to be to write something at length because you have more of an understanding of where you're going with it. I should clarify and say, this is purely in my experience. People will find their own ways, their own things to do. What I'm speaking from is not saying this is the way. This is just how I found and what I carry forward for it. One of the other tools I helped with was pacing curves. You can see one up there. 
Uh, I believe that one there is the one carried forward from a new book, Star Wars. And this is part of getting people into a story that's so big because that's a large time investment and you've got to respect that. You've got to understand these people are going to be reading your story for some time, so you want to get your pacing curve out. You want to catch them with something big at the start. You don't want to just have a linear line going up. Nobody will notice the, di the differences, the juxtaposition. So start big, grab them with something. Then you can ramp down, start world building, build up. And each event can have another rise and another little fall. Let them feel the re relaxation before you do something else to make their head spin. And then by the time you're getting to that end, you're going higher than the intro itself. Uh, it's often forgotten that intro is your best chance to make a good first impression, so you've got to throw your all into it. And again, we'll be discussing that at the panel tonight. Uh, and the last I'll say, just continue on the Star Wars things there, is stay on target, because it's very easy to get completely sidetracked in something like that. And while I don't advise you to rigidly avoid it, I would say adapt rather than just going, oh, that, I need to do that, and just rushing off to the side. So understand what you're maybe adapting with it and what you're changing along the way. Consider what that will affect later on. Uh, and if you want to see an extent of that planning, here's a look into the notepads that I was working with it. And there, I will actually stand up for a moment here. And there you can see a pacing curve here. It's not particularly clear, but you can see the forwards and backs of each scene in a chapter. Uh, I believe this was 60 Minutes in Hell, for those who have read that chapter, the first big battle with Barb. So, starting big, coming down, going bigger at the end. If you need maps to keep yourself straight, you can work with them. You've got your story treatments up at the top. Your, your basic planning areas in there, some, even if it's just little things, you'll probably forget what you're even referencing. At the time, it helps you build it together. That, I believe, was the ending of Act 2 there. And just an example of how many there are. But this one is special. This is the one I do want to add on for it. When you're going for a long-term project, always keep something on you you can write a note on. If you're at the shop and you come up with an idea that's going to help you things like, don't just tell yourself you'll remember it. You won't. Never. Keep it on you. Keep something on. Even if it's just your phone, back then it wasn't so much phone, but it, even if it's just your phone, have something to do it. To give an idea of how often I kept something on me for this, I got pulled up by the um, ensemble assembly director of World War Z on set because I was writing notes in a notepad when I was a cast extra in that movie. And uh, they thought I was taking notes about the film to try and spoil it. And uh, I, I almost got kicked off the set and lost my money from it because of that. I don't advise trying to get yourself kicked out of a job, but uh, it is a good example. Always keep that notepad on you. Uh, it was carried with me all there, and uh, I don't know what they thought I was trying to spoil. That movie sucks anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it certainly helped when you have a lot of time standing around to think, all right, what can I get done? What can I write down and just get pieced together? And the more you do that, the more it will come into your head and all come together. Note-taking is very important. Like how I forgot what the next slide is about. Um, what did you want me to say? I have no idea if that's genuine or just you, you know, just being a joke. It's both. <laughs> oh, dear. I, I took other notes, I swear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told, I told him, like I told him for five, for five days straight, repeatedly, take notes. Take Why notes. would I listen to this guy? Like, what qualifications has he got? <laughs> what? <laughs> Let's go to the next slide, dude. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know why he would talk about So the next one's about discipline, which, you know. So when it comes to writing something at length, uh, writing discipline is actually going to be a fairly important thing. I say writing discipline, but this really applies to anything. Any sort of creative outlet is going to have something very similar, whether you're an animator, an artist, a voice actor. If, you're only, if you want to do something pretty big, you do want to have a sense of discipline about yourself. And in that, you want to understand the scope of what you're doing, you want to understand how that's going to affect you, and what it is you can actually achieve. One of the things I always tell people, especially in the follow-up question of fandom, where everyone feels they need to do a giant story, start small. 
And I'm not saying take your idea you want to do and make it smaller. I'm saying do something else. Learn how to do something and complete it because completion breeds momentum. Before I wrote Marketing Number 7, I hadn't written in five years. And rather than just jump into it, I wrote a wee short story for a science fiction universe. And then I wrote a 40,000 word story based on a episode of, at the time, Gen, uh, season two, I believe. And then after that was when I started writing Murky, because that built me into the idea of completing projects. Thinking of an idea, carrying it to conception, executing it and getting it out there. That will carry you forward into your bigger ones. That sense of knowing you're actually completing these along the way. It really does help, at least for me. When you're doing it, I would also set a schedule. This happens sometimes, sometimes not others, but minimize distraction if you can, especially these days. It's unbelievable how much time you can lose if you're checking this every five minutes. It brings you out the zone, it brings you out your immersion, especially if you're story writing. I heavily encourage to minimize this to your distraction for at least an hour or two when you're working, and you will see that word count go so much faster than you, than you expected before. Having a schedule you can build into will get you used to doing it over that time. For me, I had it on, I believe it was Wednesdays and Saturdays for a while, then weekends, then an hour after work each day. Sometimes it was just a matter of any time during the day, but knowing I had to get at least this much done. It changes, it will affect with your life, but having some degree of structure in there will keep you disciplined into it because of the last one. The dreaded motivation loss. The question I've been asked most repeatedly is how do you overcome writer's block or how do you overcome lack of motivation to do stuff? Now that is, again, just my experience, I had to force myself. It's not the nicest advice. And I know a lot of people will maybe have different ways they can do it themselves, but I genuinely just had to sit down and force myself to do it for a day. If I did my writing for a day, it felt like rubbish. And then the next day I'd do it again, and it would feel like rubbish. And then the third day, I'd start seeing how much I'd done, and it actually started to feel a lot closer to the end of that chapter to release, and that will rebuild your momentum. It will suck, but it can work. Maybe not for everyone, but it can work. And you will have to just remember that I always feel it's momentum, not motivation. Motivation is a blessing, but motivation itself is sometimes difficult to just create and it can come out of nowhere. I found relying on discipline and momentum carried me much further than just on only when I felt like it. Uh, and had to remember what was waiting at the end of each chapter, getting to throw it out there. So, try and avoid getting into a rut. The longer it goes, the harder it is. After chapter 16, I had a long break, almost approaching a year. I almost fell out of it. It was my friends that carried me back into it. And coming back in, I adopted a much healthier method of just making sure I was doing something on it rather than letting it linger. So, like I said, maybe not for everyone, but that's what got me through it there. So, yeah, bring it back onto yourself. I don't remember the next slide either. I, you <laughs> changed this from before when we first looked, and I only just saw this two hours ago, and I did not take notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Despite telling you to take notes. I know. It's in the slides. Despite being an audiobook narrator, I don't listen very well. <laughs> That's great for a voice actor. Like I know, you. right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Directors love me. Yeah. All right, so... Uh, the last thing, I'll just shoot through this quickly because you know we're moving on in time and I'm sure you know, we want to get to more participation things. But playing the long game with a long project, of all the people who actually gave this inspiration, this was actually of all people Cliffy B of Epic Games. And I remember seeing him in an interview where he said the first 10% of anything is enthusiasm to get started in the project. The next 40% is passion and drive that will carry you through into doing something. But after that, it's either discipline or pace moving along with something, actually having a persistent movement of what you're doing. And then that last 10%, at least in my experience, is just absolute hell. So that last crawl to the end, not even on big projects. So watch out for that at the end and be ready for it. The bigger the project, the bigger that last 10% is. For me, that was almost two years. Uh, and that was a horrendous period to be pulling through, but you've got to know you've got to get to the end with it. In some ways, that's quite fitting, given the story, for those who've gotten near the end. 
Um, please be aware there are people in here who are just starting it, so please be understanding the spoilers. Uh, for scheduling releases, I would not get too bogged down in them, but I will say, even if you're not holding yourself to a rigid schedule, I would try and have your first few releases be on some degree of schedule. That will help build people who are actually getting into it. If they know there's more coming out, that will help you get started with it. You don't need to keep going with that. Just try not to let it slip too far. And if you are having trouble, like I said, friends can really help you. They really did with me. They kept me on the horse. That's a bad turn of phrase in this fandom. Uh, finding something in your fandom hub. In my case, it was finding people who read it, people who were on Fimfic to reply, people who would reply, even on a question daily when it updated for it. That can motivate you, and it really can keep you going when you know you're going to get some degree of response at the end. So that's why I say building that early can really help you. Uh, and I, I understand, I was very blessed to have the chance to see that after each one. A lot of writers may not get that. Uh, but if you start seeing even a couple comments, I guarantee you, you will feel so much more motivation seeing that than if it's just screaming into the void. But if you can, the last thing I would suggest, and this is just my own little silliness, is uh, have a playlist of music that you have almost tailored to your story or what you're doing. Right now I have two playlists on here for two tabletop games I'm running in order to keep me in tune with the tone, with the, the moments that I think it would go to. I'm not saying actually use it, you know, it doesn't really work well in stories. Please go to YouTube and listen to this music and pretend it's happening over the scene, you know. But it will sometimes, for some people, keep you in the game. It will keep you hearing it and going forward and thinking, hey, I remember this bit's coming because it's got this awesome bit in this track I listened to. I want to see that come the time. So that can maybe help some people. So I will say that's the end of me rambling, at least for now. But uh, I thank you all for taking the time to listen through those bits there. We're nowhere near done, but. Uh, that is essentially the end of me trying to give an idea of what actually happened in the creation of this story. I apologize I can't give so many specifics, but I mean, that was six years of my life writing that thing. A lot happened in those six years to learn it. So uh, I would thank you all for your patience. I hope some people maybe got something about your own projects out of that. Uh, so I believe we'll move on to a more audience side thing now. That's right, now you get to choose what he rambles about, everyone. So, next one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Time for the audience Q&A. Now, I was originally thinking we might have wireless microphones, but with the wires, I think we're just gonna stay up here. That's probably fine. So what we're going to do is pick people. Uh, you say your question. I should be able to hear it from up here. If not, we might need to do it some other way. So, um, do you want me to pick? Ignore those. This this is an extra thing. If anyone if anyone get, get you know gives a question through, you can come and try a Scottish sweetie made in the valley where I'm from. Never mind, don't ignore those. Yeah, I, I, and, and I promise to to those of you who I gave a sewer plume yesterday, they're better than that. Honestly, please don't trust me again, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, want me to pick? Yes, please. All right, let's one. see who first. Uh, are you in the back with the pink glove? How does it feel that you wrote? Like a story that's longer than the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> just, just to make sure that everyone heard that, I'm going to go and repeat the questions that we get. How does it feel to know you wrote a story that's longer than the Bible? Kind of annoying because it's got a bigger fan base. Oh! Oh! <laughs> it's, uh, and knowing it's actually been done is incredible because I will be writing my current stuff, which is a lot shorter. And I sometimes look back at when I'm struggling to get done with like 40,000 words for a story, and I look back and see that 1.1 million, and I sometimes think, was that just a different me? <laughs> like, am I having some sort of crossover event with someone from a different dimension? Because I don't feel like I wrote it. It's, 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 it sometimes doesn't feel like I did, because it was such a bleeding into itself experience that the length of it and how it sits out there in terms of length just blows my mind. Like I see some stories on, on Fimpet, for example, and I'm like, wow, that, guy, that person brought a 900,000 word story. Jeez, how did they do that? Oh, yeah. then I realize and remember. Thank you very much. And if you would like, you can come up and get one of these little sweets. So let's see, let's go over to the next side here. Uh, you with the uh, ponies on your jacket. 
<laughs> that's fair, that's fair. So I would like to know a bit more about the, the mint monsters. Uh, I've been extremely curious. I don't know if I've missed something, but I yep. think there's never like a real visual description of what they look like. Yep, it's the mint monster question. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm actually delighted this one came up because I've been asked this so many times from so many people about the, uh, the mid monsters, which in a spoiler free way I will comment are things that turn up later in the story which are rarely described, vaguely described, uh, and are very much intended to be a, a horror filled chapter. The the mint, I don't, I barely even want to see monsters because that almost feels like I'm giving too much away. But the, the mint uh, monsters are something that actually came from an old dream to some degree. Um, when I was a kid, I actually used to have rather regular night terrors. And if you know the difference between a nightmare and a night terror, they're actually quite different things. A night terror is substantially harder to wake up from, and you are at times aware that you are in it. So, pretty horrifying for a kid. That might explain a lot, actually. But. One of them I remember was being locked in an asylum room with um, this humanoid person who had like nuts, as in the nuts and bolts, who had nuts over their eyes, and you could see the eyeball through it, and they were uh, looking very dangerous, like they were about to leap at me at any time, and I'm trapped in this claustrophobic little space with them. But what I remembered predominantly was the sound, which was a very inconsistent sound of metallic to organic gurg gurgling and scraping. And this smell, this weird smell that came from it, that I remember thinking, I remember asking, uh, you know, my mother when I woke up, I was like, I was like 12 at the time, and I asked, you know, what, what does it smell like this or this? And she said, rotten mint. And, uh, I never figured out if mint could even go rotten later since then, but that was sort of rough that. I will clarify, what I say I visually saw is not what's in the story. Uh, however, I deliberately kept it vague because I always feel in horror the implication and the knowing that you will never make anything as scary as what's up here is very powerful. But at the same time, I didn't want to just take a cop out and say, hey, there's nothing. So there is actually a canon image of them. Well, not, not a physical image. There is a canon image in here of what they are and what created them. However, the hints are through the story and people will have to build up to see what's there. There are a few hints. Some of them are a wee bit of red herrings. Some of them are a little contradictory. So I apologize I can't give a full descriptive. I feel the effect of them is only maintained if uh, they remain a bit of a mystery what's going on for it. However, if people are really curious to piece together the, the what of it, I would recommend going through chapters 21, 20, uh, sorry. Yeah, chapters 21 and the final chapter have the clearest indicative things that are free of red herrings. So if you want to piece together things, I would maybe look through there. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. So that, that's about all I can really say for it. They are very definitely somewhere between a physical and a non-physical enemy. But uh, I'm uh, very glad that people seem to constantly always ask and wonder about them because that lets me know, hey, they're actually doing their job. And just like four, you are now allowed, if you'd like to, to come up and get a Scottish candy. We're going to jump over to the left side again, and uh, you in the cowboy's hat. Yep. Occasionally, uh, there is an occasional sense. Um, I've been writing, I'll get to the, my next pitch, uh, things are actually what I'm doing right now. I'll get to that in a second. But when I'm writing that new stuff, I simultaneously sometimes feel that some of it is some of the best writing I've ever done because I learned a lot through murky. Uh, there are periods of murky that I feel are weaker than they could have been. Um, I have to feel that way. You know, I have to be my own observant critic. 
the stuff, but there is some of the stuff I did right now that after a while I started feeling I was falling into a bit of a middle of the road sort of idea where it wasn't getting the same highs that Murky was. And I did feel an urge to say, no, I need to do something that's going to get those same big rushes that Murky gave and get those same big moments that I feel made that story. And I started writing a part of what I'm writing now purely to try and match that feeling. So yes, you're correct. I definitely have felt that. And even if the other stuff I write hasn't reached the same audience, which is fair, uh, I feel like it's definitely up there in terms of the quality for it because I remember feeling that exact sensation of, hey, I'm, I'm not getting that. I want to try and match that again. I want to try and get those moments that people remember and uh, live up to what I did before. So yeah, very accurate that that can happen. And you can claim a Scottish candy if you'd like, or just come up afterwards, it's up to you. Yep. Bouncing back over to this side of the room, Blackjack. Um, I don't know how much smaller this question is, but For others who might not have heard, it's the most painful thing that he had to cut to get out to get the story in. There's a number of things. Um, the editing room floor, as you may say, was strewn with content, which for a story this big would almost feel weird there would be a lot left out there. There's a lot, there was a chapter that was planned, I'm trying to think how to say it without major spoilers. There was a chapter that was planned for early act three of the story that was going to be a story surrounding them being sort of trapped in a loop via a memory machine that was going to replay the events of the past that led up to how the content that's below Philadelphia ended up there in the first place. And it was essentially going to be that they would go through so far, fail, get killed, and it would restart and it'd have to get further, like a perpetually revolving, you know, live, die, repeat, live, die, repeat, live, die, repeat, and then Edge of Tomorrow released a month later. <laughs> At that point, I was, I was actually writing it to my editors, look, took one look at that chapter and they said, um, and they gave a, a really lovely, carefully thought out piece of feedback for it, which is where they said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> this is crap. And I was like, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I feel great now. <laughs> So they were right. They, I mean, they did, they, they did uh, give a much better explanation, uh, saying through it. No, it was because after what happened at the end of Act Two, it simply was not what people were looking to see. Everyone wanted to go to Act Three, going right for the end climax of the story, and then this was just too much of a veer away from it. And I do miss getting to do it because I felt like it was a really unique story that I could do. Um, unfortunately, Tom Cruise turned down the request to be part of it. He had another one. But I thought for a while I would do it as a separate story. Uh, I never really got around to it. Uh, Fr Frontier 6-2, I believe it was called. Um, unfortunately, I never got to it, but that was probably the most painful loss because that was a whole planned chapter, basically in the bin. It was all it was fully planned. I was writing a quarter of it, and it just, whoop, away it goes. So that's a lot of content that I spent a lot of days on working just went nowhere. So even if the content itself I feel was better being gone, the actual process of writing it just being cut out, that hurt. That hurt a lot. I also had an idea to have a stable they would find under Philadelphia where they'd go in and there was the stable mayor was taking everyone's cutie marks away to make them live in a land of quality where everyone's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, guess what happened? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a good question. And Scottish candy for you. And we're going to bounce back over to the other side. Uh, let's go with you right there with two fingers up. Okay, hi. Um, so I, I'm going to say uh, briefly, I don't, I'm not actually read this story, but I'm here because of the word 1.1 million words, which is just like, okay, got to go to that one. Uh, discipline. That's what I'm here to ask you about. Um, I have to give a little bit of feedback here. I haven't... I'm running a story, and as somebody who's read maybe 90 fanfics that are over 200,000 words, the thing I despise the most when I read is I'm reading the story and then the guy never finishes it. So I swore I will never be that person. So my plan has always been that you, I will post my first chapter when the last chapter is finished editing. Without a single person is looking at it before except my editor. Yeah. And in fact, I want to finish the whole story 
before the editors look at it because I want them to edit it with the entire framework in their head to know what to take out and take in. But as you can imagine, that means I have no positive, like you said, people bring you comments, people give you that. I have nothing like that. Yep. So it's just like, how do you even keep going at this rate? Yep. And two, based on what's similar or not, I have an act one, I have an act three, I don't have an act two. Yep. Advice? Oh, sure, sure. That's actually, that's, a, that's actually a really good question, that second one particularly. Mm -hmm. um, so, as for the first part, in terms of um, having the content written, you know, before it goes out, I actually read a fantastic little told sappy shipping story uh, the, other, uh, the other month called uh, Monophobia, written by a rather wonderful author, and he had written it all before he released it. But I noticed as he was releasing it, he released it on a schedule. Yeah. And there were edits made in it that were very clearly edited because of the responses to things right. in the earlier chapters. So it's worth remembering that what you've already written is still a living text until the point it goes live. Sure. So if you have something that's got five chapters, 10, 15 chapters, if you're releasing, say, one a week on a schedule, if it's already written, you might as well. You have that time still to go in and make those edits as you go based on that feedback for it. Um, but for the initial writing of it, I would say definitely find your own kind of closed group if you can. And that can be tough, difficult, I know. Oh, okay, yeah. I tried to go back to my phone. Okay, so this began as yeah. a side project of another project that I was an editor for. Right. So uh, I've been working on that project for about six years and I started writing my own in the last two years. Yeah. The problem is all the other people in that side project no longer want to work in a question and are creating their own universe. So I kind of lost what I had originally yeah. when I was a member of that team. Yeah. It can be difficult. I, I totally get that. It can be really difficult to find a particular group who's willing to look over that for you. Um, but I would say even with a smaller group, um, or even just those few, my, the stuff I'm writing right now predominantly has an audience of like five. <laughs> right now my predominant audience is my little brother. Yeah. So a lot, I, I think a lot of that is you've got to remember that you also have a personal stake in this. If you feel it's a story you have something to really put through to, remember that snake and remember what it means to you. If you write a scene and you come out of it feeling a little emotional with yourself, that will carry you just as much as anything. Uh, for the Act 2 problem for it, uh, I always advise people you might want to see something you know, before you get to you know, know the end, before you get there. Um, however, what I've made the best advice I think for Act 2 is to use that as your crux point of switch. And that's a very fancy term for meaning when you have your story build up in Act 1 to where it's going to go, that Act 2 point is when you want to throw a curveball at it. Something that is not just going to progress linearly, but something that is going to give those characters something that they maybe need to overcome. A great example, to go back to A New Hope, uh, the first act of that is all in Tatooine, is building up into Luke going away. Act two's twist, essentially. The thing that sets that in motion is they get caught by the Death Star. And that initiates that act two that builds up various aspects of the story for that act three to then happen after their escape. And that's just a very simple example of saying use that middle period to throw them into a different area that will allow you to explore what's going to come in the third. The problem is that the biggest thing that happens in the story, which is literally a cluster gets invaded, so it's impossible to get bigger, happens in Act 1. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how to, how can I outdo that in Act 2? I think, uh, um, I mean, obviously I, I, could, I could sit for a long time and tell the exact story, but I would say if you feel the scale has hit its height in Act 1, uh, Remember that scale can also scale down to be incredibly important to the individual characters and what can happen through their invasion setting, a lot can happen. Yes, that was the point. So think of what can happen more personally to those characters in that setting with it is what I advise there. Thank yeah, you. That was an really interesting question. Thank I, you. You know, sort of like blah blah blah. No, I know. I could, I, could, I, could, I, could, I could kidnap this panel, so I won't. Thank you. No worries. Oh, you have earned a Scottish candy. Absolutely. And we're going to go right back over to the other side here. Oh, that's a lot of hands. Okay. <laughs> I will try and fire through these a little more. Okay, uh, let's go with you there in the glasses. So, when I'm writing, I tend to focus more on character interactions and dialogue, and I have a really hard time trying to describe scenes that are interesting to me. So, what I find myself doing is trying to think of scenes where I'm describing a scene that I want to be in the story, and I want to be in the Yeah. So is it the problem where you feel like you're you're just getting sort of a talking head thing where it's just a dialogue repeating over and over again? Yeah, I had that problem. I actually had that problem exactly. What I found really helped me with that was um, 
Can I go back to the start of that scene? And what I would like is have the living world around it, consider the environment they're in. If, I mean, okay, sometimes you can't avoid two people just being in a room, but say, rather than be, you know, ask yourself, does it have to be in an empty room? Can it be somewhere where there's other crowds? Do they need to, just some examples off the top of my head, you know, keep moving away from noise? Is someone going to bump into? Do they have to pause speaking because they can't say this around other people? Um, an active environment around them allows you more opportunity to describe things that are happening and it allows you more uh, physical events that can happen to break up those big chunks of dialogue. Uh, I would also maybe look at the dialogue itself and say, all right, if it's just very dialogue heavy, start really being sort of murderous with your own scripting and just say, right, what needs to actually be here? What can be done, you know, shorter or briefer? Do they actually need to say this? And sometimes, as they say, you know, you've got to, I'm not going to condone child violence, but you do say you have to kill your babies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, if you've not heard that one before, that is a grand old editing one there. Kill your babies, because that's what everyone thinks of their content. Thank you very much. All right, and we're going to go back over to the other side. Well, one hand, a non Hi. Hi there. So you, you're, you are one of the authors whose story has been printed in a physical book. Yeah. What was this like on your end? Were you caught in terms of you being contacted for the printing? What were your contributions? What, were the, what was the back and forth logistics of how that happened? Of how of the working with that? And what, was, what did it you realize that people wanted a physical copy of your book. Yeah. No, no worries at all. So that whole sequence, it started with being, being contacted by the who did the printing. And it was fairly hands-off in terms of actually doing the printing. Their first thing they offered was just to do the print as it was from FinFit. Um, I disagreed with this because I knew the FinFit one had errors in it. It had typos, it had things I wanted to edit up from previous chapters. And I felt if people were paying for this, I wanted them to have something that was worth the money it would inevitably cost. Uh, so they were getting the art done by the wonderful Haley through there. You might have seen her uh, her vendor out at the opposite end of the vendor hall. But for my part, it was mostly looking through the whole story, correcting typos, changing a few little things that no longer made sense, or just updating it, getting over my addiction to ellipses originally with it, uh, learning how to use a comma, which I apparently somehow missed since the start of my life writing. And with that, it was very much a back and forward of, here's this chapter done, here's this chapter done, here's this chapter done. Uh, there were some hmm, grinding moments of decisions, you know, when they were saying, hey, we've got to get this done, we've got to get this out now, or we're going to miss the printing thing. And uh, I sort of had to push back on it a few times and say, no, no, I, I refuse to let this go out. I do not give my go ahead for this until this is ready because it's a lot of money and I did not want people to be getting an incomplete thing with it. Um, it was very hands off on my part in terms of the actual printing. I just sort of worked on the typo fixing and some of the content at the front and back. When they put it up for order, I at one point when I said, hey, how many copies are there, you know, actually being ordered? And my genuine expectation was about um, 80, 90, I thought would go out. And then he came back to me and told me it was over 800. Which I had to go and do a very British thing and have a very emergency cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> With sugar. Uh, and go forward about a year from there when it actually finally came about and it actually arrived at my workplace and very thankfully I had a, a work friend who, on, who knew about it and was very supportive, uh, yeah. a, very, a very nice person. Uh, she, so she understood my absolute excitement to come bounding through, uh, you know, I, I currently at work translation studio just carrying this three kilogram box that could viably have killed someone if I fell on the way. And uh, just being delighted. Amusingly, the thing that caught me most about it was looking down and seeing the ISBN number. That was, weirdly enough, that was the moment that made me think, oh my goodness, that's, this is a real thing. It has an ISBN number. This might be the nerdiest author thing I've ever said. But that was what made it real for me. When it was officially on that, the same number everyone else gets, you know, through all the influences I love. Thank you very much. Do you want to do questions until 25 after and take one or two more? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Okay, a couple more questions. Let's 
go with you there, sitting next to the camera. I, I was a cast member running down a street. That was all. <laughs> I'm not actually in the movie industry properly. I was just a random extra they hired for minimum wage to go out in Scottish weather and run around in it for a while. <laughs> I get shouted at my director. Um, I get shouted yeah, at my directors every so often. Um, so in terms of qualification, I have no formal kind of English um, you know, thing past high school, essentially. Um, however, I did have a very good English teacher in high school who would really push us on creative content and I've been trying to track her down actually just to thank her because she gave me the hobby of writing and she always pushed us and gave us really strangely dark stories that we probably shouldn't have been reading at that age you know the ones where we got to swear in class you know wonderful stuff and uh but her energy in selling creativity and her pushing me to go with creativity um, every single time I had to do like, critical writing, I'd get a C. Every single time I had to do a creative writing, I would get an A because of her. And I carried that forward out of it. It was purely just a, a personal growth talent after that point. I just kept doing it um, as a hobby on and off until eventually starting it a lot more full time. As a, well, I would almost like to say started as an artist of it, you might say. Uh, the closest I would get to it is I did computer animation in university, which gave me some degree of structure and framework about planning and all that that uh, helped me do larger content. But uh, no formal qualification for anything, uh, which just go say, anyone, anyone can do it, even idiots who grew up in a Christian school in the middle of a valley in Scotland with, you know, who probably still live on black and white TVs. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, I think we have time for one. I've got stuff to kick me out. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we have slides after that. Uh, black sleeve back there. Oh. Yeah, you. <laughs> so, what research did you conduct, and what methods did you use to organize the information you accumulated, and by what you use, and what was developed? Because so, that was on the research on how to use and then what to use from it. Yeah. Um, the content of the story, hence the viewer discretion advice at the beginning of this one, the content of the story does involve a uh, uh, opponent trying to escape from slavery in Philadelphia and Fall of Equestria. Now those of you who have read the original Fall of Equestria will know it's very much based on the pit from Fallout 3. There is a heavy degree of um, brutality going on with it. So I did at one point go and start reading some books. I wish I could remember them, but there's some books on the history of slavery and the content of what happens within there. And I promise you, no matter how dark some of the story gets, it's actually toned down from some of the reality. Mm -hmm. Which I, I saw some, some of it and I quickly realized I'm, I'm not using that. That's, that's too brutal. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not something that feels villainous, it just feels upsetting. So having to balance some pretty heavy themes against that was difficult. Uh, some of the stuff that went in there, I either edited out before, adjusted later, or just didn't use it all. Um, and some of it I had to adjust more to fit the setting and the tone of what I was going for. Uh, some of it, I kind of stopped looking at that stuff after all because it genuinely was not great. Um, and I focused my research in other areas because I felt like the whole, the pit, the original Philadelphia thing was pretty well set by that point. So I focused my research into other areas, um, predominantly for the larger battle scenes later in it. I was doing a lot of uh, speaking with um, people who had come back to the UK from Afghanistan, mm. come back there to learn about what you hear, what you smell, all that sort of thing, and as well as watching a whole bunch of uh, Ross Kemp in Afghanistan was a great source for getting an idea of how people move, what you're actually doing, uh, and I was delighted to hear that some veterans came back and were like, hey, those battle scenes had some things in there we remember that we don't see often. So, uh, yeah, just often speaking to people, looking at sources, and having to evaluate how they fit the tone of what I was writing would be the, 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 the genuine answer there. Thank you. Okay. Want to do one more question? Yeah, one more. Okay, does anyone have a short one? One that you probably won't ramble on too long. 
let's go with uh, you, Red Jacket. What was uh, what was your favorite character to, to write? Oh boy. Uh, the, the genuine, fullest, honest answer is Protege, for sure. Yeah. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh wow, you can I would have been a protege fan all along! <laughs> Thank you for letting me do that bit. I was waiting the whole time for that. God. Or is a planning. That, that, that's why you didn't take notes. You were busy planning that. Hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, Protege for sure. Yeah, he was uh, he was so investing to write all time. And every scene with him with Murphy was incredibly fun to do with their chemistry. And very quickly realizing that there was uh, something going on there between those two that was incredibly investing and totally not at all lazily homoerotic. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, definitely Protege. Uh, although, I will say, writing Weatherbane purely for learning so many swear words. <laughs> Especially, even Mozart, well, I got to learn to swear in Russian as well. That was great fun. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much for the questions. A lot of good discussion. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the last thing I'll just say before we go, uh, yeah, what else I'm doing right now, uh, I am raising other stuff on Fenfic. If you know what Marky is on Fenfic, you can find my other stories there. Uh, follow up question of the Untold Individuals. It's not a long story, it is a collection of stories. It's focusing on individual characters that uh, I either got inspired by, by friends, or wanted to do as a gift for them. And it's looking at different areas of the wasteland and its history and its locations and how those characters make their way through there. From a Pegasus thief that's living in a, uh, a trapped cage of a town, familiar territory for me, um, through to a propaganda icon from before the war that has woken up as a ghoul in a world that still remembers her as an icon that she never really was. Wow. Through to a zebra uh, having to be exiled from his, uh, his home and trying to find a new place in Manhattan when he barely knows the language and the world just seems all that bit hazy, which was my first ever one I wrote in an abstract style. I'd be very interested for how people think of that. The current big one I'm writing is Home in the Black, which is a science fiction, very Firefly themed and based, if anyone's seen that classic show. Uh, I, it, it galls me to call Firefly a classic at this point. <laughs> uh, it is based on a tabletop game that had the wonderfully imaginative name by my friend Space Horse. And uh, it features all those characters you can see there. Uh, it's worth noting the Hippogriff was prior to the movie, we didn't know how they looked at that point, we were stupid. Uh, but that is probably the work I'm most proud of since Murky. It's the one that got me back into it, the first chapter of it, Glass Ceiling, is probably the most personal piece I've ever written uh, that had a lot of very um, deep feelings from me, from my own life in there. So even if you don't want to read the rest of it, I highly advise reading Glass Ceiling from it. That one really uh, was what got me back on. I almost said back on the horse again. Um, they got me back into this hobby in the first place. Yeah. And the last thing I'm writing, I'm currently planning to write, is actually taking a dip into the romance area of things. Uh, something I've never really written before, at least as a focus. And with that, it is going to focus on something that's very much about one's personal self-image and the care of how the world around you sees you, mixed in with the themes of overthinking, of hiding away the hobbies that you genuinely enjoy. If you're doing something that you really find incredible and that you are very proud of, but you just can't tell most of the people around you about. Mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, you can identify where this has come from, which is why it's so special to be out here today and actually be able to be so open about it, openly, not just in a discourse to so many people with it. So I would be delighted if people checked out what else I had there uh, and what else uh, we can maybe go forward and write from then, then on and see what people think of it. So I would just give one last thank you for everyone who took the time to come in, but more importantly, to those who read it. it I, I said at the beginning, you have to respect the time investment of your readers, and I do, incredibly. It is not a small story to read. It's not an easy story to read. And as much as I said how much a heart it was to write, I chose that, and I knew what I was getting into. A lot of people who started reading it didn't, and they stuck with it as the page count and the word count ballooned and ballooned and ballooned. And even through its weaker chapters, you guys stuck with it, and you got to the end, and 
I still to this day go and reread the comments on that last chapter sure. because nothing can hold me together more than seeing that people genuinely got something out of it. And for that, as much as I'm on here, I want to thank all of you for giving me that opportunity. So please, thank you. Give yourself. Thank you. I will, of course, thank all the lovely artists who did the artwork throughout this that I grabbed from. Um, yeah, the Murky Protege thing, it had to be there. It had to be there. So, uh, the artwork in the middle is by Haley through there, and she, that was the chapter one and end of the story there. No spoiler, but those of you who can see it, if you know, you know. Uh, and particularly to the artists, you know, especially those who are here who have helped. Uh, there are those, I know you don't want to point to that, but uh, there are those who are here that have almost kind of rekindled my personal love of my own story in a way by giving it a new generation of artwork to come together. So uh, even if you're not being necessarily pointed out, thank you very much, Krim. That was, uh, it's an incredible thing that you've done for this. Now we have hit our limit. Uh, I think I can see some staff there with some people from the next panel giving me the. Oh, is that the next panel there? I guess or no? And, and okay, this is technically a viewer discretion is advised panel. So in the great words of Lana Pater is Vegeta, fuck up. Let's go. <laughs> Questions? Oh my god. Okay, you know what? Yeah, let's keep going. Let's just keep going until they throw us out. Uh, someone, someone. You at the end. Is it hard to like? Having written things in more original things since, I can definitely say it does benefit having those words fall out equestrian on the front of it. It is a built-in fan base to some degree, and it, especially at the time I started, uh, when it was still at its height, I believe I started before the original finish, so I still had wow. that, that going on. And uh, yeah, thank you, Kate Fat, for writing to Kate Fat for writing content at the end of Full Equestria that totally scuppered my entire idea in Philadelphia for a while. But I, I had to write around that. But yeah, having that benefit is really useful. And any writer is lying to your face if they say they don't want to have a decent amount of people reading it and getting that feedback. Yeah. So yeah, it definitely does affect it. Um, however, I feel since then it's given me the confidence to go forward to other ones very, very easily. Are uh, you next panel or? OK, so we do have people coming. Yeah, cool. All right, uh, we, should, we shall get out of your way then. As I said, we will keep going until we're kicked out and you're here to kick us out. Wonderful, Woo! thank you. All right, thank you all for coming. Um, I will hang around just outside there. If there's other questions you wanted to ask, Buddy, I, I saw some people with their books. If you want the books to come over and get signed, whatever, I will happily do that. I'll happily answer any questions. I got nowhere to be for a while, so just come up and say hi. Absolutely no worries. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much for watching Fox and Crystal's Great Adventure at HarmonyCon 2024. Please stay tuned for HarmonyCon 2025, January 31st to February 2nd. We hope to see you there and have a great year. Bye guys. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe.